if everything's been going well for everyone. And yeah, just wanted to firstly introduce the ch the team. So this year's president, we got Isaac or on Slack at Spud. We got our Hi, treasurer. Oh yeah. We got our treasurer Zach uh, at Scott Morrison. It's not the actual prime minister, so don't worry. It's fine. And then we've got the secretary, which is me. I'm Jeremy. I'm Zesh. And you can just find us on Slack by our handles there. Um, so Slack, it's pretty much our messaging and communication app. It's probably the best way to contact most of us, just because like I use it daily. Um, it's got a iOS, Android web app, pretty much everything. Um, sorry, Vera, could you just mute your mic? Oh. Shabob, yeah, she is a legend. Anyways, um, if you're looking for a link to join our Slack, it's just right there at the bottom, highlighted in green, bit.ly forward slash disk SLK in all caps. And that will just send you to our Slack page and you can sign up and join there. Uh, so at the start of this year, there was a lot of talks about Discord. Now, <laughs> yeah, you can't actually trust it. If you don't trust it, just like use a link expander. But anyways, there's been a lot of talk about uh, a disc discord and um, kind of it's been a bit of a side project, but I finally created everything that should be like a nice authentication system, kind of like Slack, but it's all custom built. So if you want to like kind of beta test it soon, uh, I'll be like going through those stages. So just message me on uh, Slack or like Facebook or wherever, and I'll send you an invite link to it and we'll get something going. Uh, immersive Labs, it's a good place to start learning if you're sort of struggling to get the basic concepts and like trying to wrap your head around a lot of kind of harder topics. Immersive Labs provides like a really good sort of location to ease you into the security sort of mindset and like basic vulnerabilities and like how to spot them and how to actually exploit them. It's a good bit of fun. Um, done a few of them and yeah, it's just fun. Uh, as you know, we've got a knowledge base or you might not know, but we actually have a knowledge base. We're looking for more contribution to that knowledge base so then we can build it up for all of our disk members. We've got a few in there already but we'd love to add some more and love to hear from you guys. Um, I don't know if he's here in the meeting, but usually at Kets does a lot of the knowledge base stuff. Not sure if he's still around, but we'll see. If not, just message me and I'm sure we can figure it out. At anyways, Hack the Box. Um, yeah, it's a pretty good environment. Just feel like having a bit of fun, sit back, hack some stuff and yeah, there's not much more to say. If you want to join our Hack the Box team, just drop a message in the Hack the Box channel and Slack, and we'll get you added to that team. It's an awesome platform. Oh, yeah. So just a reminder, we have our AGM coming up on the 9th of September. We pushed it back just because, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a long story, but we had to push it back. Uh, nominations will close on the 8th. And just make sure to check your emails for like the registration links. And just a reminder, you have to be a current member of the club to actually be nominated and actually vote within the AGM. Anyways, now that that's out of the way, we'll get on to the main part of today's session, hunting XSS. So this is a bit of a project that I've been working on. Um, I. I really wanted to find like my own vulnerability and have it like actually identified as a CVE. Now, uh, pretty much what this talk is going to go through, it's just the basics of XSS, XSS and pretty much how do you sort of get in the mindset of finding a CVE and actually like exploiting it. But, 
let's get started. So, as you know, I'm Jeremy Zesh, I'm the secretary of DISC, daytime and nighttime hacker, pretty much just sitting at my desk hacking stuff. Um, I love web security, I love physical security, they're probably my main two interests in security, so if you want to talk about like anything that's related to that or even just like general security stuff, I'm always here. Um, I can't really spell and I can't really talk either, so please excuse if um, I'm a little bit slow. But anyways, if you see the men in black, say hi for me. They're always watching. They're always in the shadows. You never know. But anyways, so some of you might be wondering, what is XSS? And this is really sad that I have to say this, but I've heard from a few people that kind of do focus on the Deacon coursework a lot, that they get XSS, um, what's it called? Confused with cross-site request forgery. Now, XSS is not cross-site request forgery. XSS is cross-site scripting. Um, so pretty much just the main difference is that XSS is like actually executing JavaScript while cross-site request forgery is like you will have a login form on like one website and then there might be a sensitive form like a bank transfer uh, form on your bank's website and you might like um, log in onto that onto like the fake website and then unknowingly that um, other like hidden form will send another request to the bank's website and pretty much that will transfer money from your account into someone else's account. That's a really basic overview. But anyways, so there are two main types of XSS or cross-site scripting are uh, reflected, stored and technically third, which you like see when you open up dev tools on Facebook. It's a uh, self XSS. It's pretty much where you like copy and paste a script directly into your debugger and I don't really advise you do that unless you kind of trust the script or you know exactly what it's going to do if it's got like a bunch of hex in it and it's looking kind of sketch um, probably don't do that that's that's my best bit of advice so oh, yeah so what is reflected XSS well pretty much it's like say if you fail a login or something and like you see an error message on the page sometimes what a web application will do is it will have the error message sent back in um like a url parameter so say if like you go to your bank site and you get an error message and then that error message you can actually see it in the url bar so uh, pretty much the main problem with this is that if that error message is there and there and they're not doing proper sanitization on that actual error message you can just inject your own scripts directly into the DOM and that will get you code execution then if an attacker were to send you say a link to um, your bank with that uh, reflected actual payload in the URL then when you click that link and open it in your browser, it will just like pretty much execute that JavaScript and then no, you're done. But anyways, stored XSS. So, uh, no, CSRF is, um, what's it called? Where you would um, say if you had website A and website B and no, that's uh, not CSRF, that's most likely XSS. CSRF is where they say website A, website B. Website B has uh, a form on it that should only be able to be done on website B, but on website A, the attackers made a form that's like um, sending data to website B, and because website B isn't actually validating the origin of the form. So the origin, it's just a request header. And then what's it called? That's like on website A. It's hard to explain without like drawing it out. 
but <laughs> um no not at all but website a would be like sending the data to website b just you know what i'm doing a horrible job of explaining this i will explain it to you afterwards but it's not csrf anyways we've got stored xss yeah and yeah exactly so like say in a phishing email if you wanted to like have a link oh true yes true all right let me do this thing that's some like big brain moves all right all right so say these are going to be our two websites um So these are our two websites, A and B, and um, A, it's going to have like a good form with like a login and password, right? <laughs> Pretty much. And then B, say here, we also have a form, but it's going to be directed to go to the same location as this form on B. See, B goes to itself, but A is sending data to B, if you get what I mean. Um, I, I don't really know how else to explain it. Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> but yeah, so like, say this would be like post and like So like on website B, the post request would look something like that, but on website A, oh, can't move this text box. It would be like post. So like pretty much this one on website A, we're actually sending the um, request, as you can see here, to website B. And website B is only sending it to itself. So like that's where the login's going. But with website A, we're actually sending that data to um, website B. And then because it's not validating uh, where the data is coming from on website B, then what's it called? Uh, we can just send data from website A. But anyways, we'll get back to the main presentation. Oh, this is annoying. I have to re-upload the um, what's it called? PowerPoint. Just give me a second. Oh, what? Wait, how can I switch? Um, all right. I'm still new to Teams and I don't know how to switch scenes yet, so just have to wait a second. <laughs> We'll just get back to where we were quickly. Uh, so yeah, um, that's reflected XSS, mm -hmm. where um, <laughs> pretty much, I'll, I'll try to. Uh, reflected XSS is like where you would like click on a link and then that link has JavaScript in it and then next minute you're owned. Um, what's it called, stored XSS? pretty much where you can save the data and it isn't sanitized correctly. 
and you can just like inject um, custom scripts and like sections just str like straight into the actual website and it will just be reflected straight into the DOM. So like think like usernames when you sign up. So say if I change my username to like script alert one and then like signed up to Facebook and then you browse to my Facebook profile and you just get an alert box. That would be an example of like stored XSS. So like why is this a why is this a main problem? Like why can't we just run code on everyone's browsers? Like it would be great. But what if like you had a lot of money and you wanted to keep that money and then like someone chained an open redirect or a stored XSS with an open redirect and what's it called? They sent you to that malicious page where someone had an XSS payload to transfer all of that money straight out of their account, your account, straight to them. And like, of course you click the link because like it's your bank and they want you to click links. But anyways, yeah, it's a, it, it's a big problem. And I, I don't know what more there needs to be said other than the top text, bottom text meme. Like, bruh, it's a problem. And yeah, people wouldn't have trust in the internet. Like, no one would be able to go onto eBay and then buy stuff. No one would be able to, like, go watch Netflix without having an alert box pop up. It would be hilarious, but, like, obviously it's a massive problem. And... Yeah, it's it's kind of what I picture the internet in like CSI to be like because they, they just sit there for like two seconds and then they're like, I'm in. But anyways, um, yeah, you know, that that's great and all, but like how to hack Facebook? That's that's a good question. But my example earlier, I used Facebook uh, with like the username or like name parameter as like the main example but the reason that doesn't work is because of filtering and a lot of like blacklisting whitelisting like removing attributes oh <laughs> that's stupid i have removing attributes twice nice deal but yeah um pretty much like the de developers do not want you to execute code on their kind of i guess web apps and I think it's really fun to sort of find ways around that and actually execute my own code on their web apps. That's what I just love about XSS. But the where it comes in like difficult is actually like creating the bypasses for the developers' protections, aka like whitelisting, blacklisting, or removing attributes. And yeah, it's just a lot of fun. So you might be wondering, like, that's great and all, but how do I actually, like, find reflected XSS? Well, I usually just play around with um, URL parameters. Say, like, that example with the error page earlier. Um, just where there's a reflected error message, just chuck in some HTML elements and see if it gets rendered. Because if it gets rendered, there's a high likelihood that they're not actually sanitizing it correctly. And then it, once you go and test your XSS payload, nine times out of 10, it will just fire. So it's pretty fun. But in PHP, this is a pretty good example. Um, just where there's like no protection at all. And it's just echoing out whatever you send it. So pretty much it's taking uh, the request parameter name and just concatenating that to a string without any filtering or like just protection in general. So we can directly alter the DOM through the request parameter of name. So that's pretty neat. So I've made a kind of practice site to go ahead and test for reflected XSS, stored XSS, and CSP bypass stuff. It's pretty basic at the moment, but I'm adding more like sort of different challenges and just like weird xss -y things that I think of. And yeah, I just wanted to give you guys like a good five or so minutes to just go around, have a have a mess around with that. And during this time, if you want to ask me any questions, just go ahead. 
And yeah, I'll chuck the link in uh, Slack. Uh, not Slack, in Teams. And yes, that is my domain. So don't stress. It's reputable, I promise. Pretty much, Zach. You should definitely click that link, Zach. See what happens. <laughs> So does anyone like have any questions just so far? Yeah, I also got a, a link to my GitHub where I'm actually hosting the Docker files for the XSS sandbox. So if you wanted to run it yourself, you can just clone that Git repo and then run it locally. Just in case mine goes down, I guess, and it probably will soon. But yeah. All right, we'll keep going with the with the presentation. So here I'm going to be talking about finding XSS within Tiki Wiki. So I found my first XSS um, probably about a month ago and actually got it as a valid CVE. So feeling pretty good about that. It took me like a day or two of source code analysis and then like a live test install that I just ran on my Pi because like it was just like easy to run on. Oh, thanks guys. <laughs> um, but having a test instance instance is probably um, one of the best things that I ever did because like without that text test instance, it was kind of difficult to put all the pieces together and actually like kind of visualize and actualize the vulnerabilities. But so when I first unzipped the Tiki actual install files, there was just so many of them. And I was just thinking to myself, what am I going to do with this? Like, 
how am I going to go through each one of these files and just hunt for vulnerabilities? So it was definitely intimi intimidated, intimidating. And yeah, it was just crazy. But what I thought about is how can I narrow down my scope? So one thing that I thought of is I wanted to find an unauthenticated bug. So what I did, I narrowed my scope down with graph. So what I noticed within the authenticated files is that there was this call to a variable called access and then the function check permission. So it's just calling it from a class and then it checks the required permission, but that part doesn't really matter. Um, so now that we know that it's calling that class with the check permission function, we can just do a grep and pretty much grep for all the files that don't include the access check permission in all of like the first layer of PHP files. If I wanted to do it like properly, I probably would have ran it against all the library files as well. But majority of the library files, they just redirect to index. So I, I was mainly focusing on like the core Tiki, um, Tiki Wiki like pages. But anyways, we wanted to find, now since I got an idea that I wanted to get XSS, um, I created this disgusting regex and a bash loop just to like grab for all the files that don't contain it. And then pretty much, wait, I'll just chuck it in the chat. So if you remember um, earlier from that XSS challenge one, pretty much it was just being concatenated into the, into the DOM. And pretty much what that was is just PHP concatenation for strings. So I just created this disgusting regex that would go through like all of the characters and pretty much just like match those string concatenations. I had a much cleaner version of this. I just want to say that, but Gref just was not liking it, but it worked fine in Sublime Text. Like it was perfect, but just Gref. It's weird, man. So I reduced that down. How many did I reduce that down? Yeah, I reduced it from 198 files down to 49 with string concatenation. So that was awesome. <coughs> Excuse me. So continuing to look through, I like just started opening them up, just looking at the source code and just like looked for some pretty interesting files. And I found the file tiki error underscore simple dot PHP. And uh, pretty much I noticed the first thing I noticed was that it was implementing an XSS filter. And when I saw this, I was like, oh no, this is going to be annoying. But then like I noticed that it was doing string replace and like the only real protection was that XSS filter. And you could see the, um, that first parameter, which is request error. So you can send a post request or a get request with the variable name error. And that can only be 256 characters long. Then the second parameter request title, that can be as long as you want. So that's pretty good. But we've got to have a look at this filter. So looking for looking through the actual file, we saw that it came from the tiki dash filter dash base dot PHP. And then it uh, called the class tiki filter and with the function get XSS. So it looks like it's loading um, the Tiki filters from somewhere. So what I did, I just did another grep um, and I just grepped for the class name Tiki filter um, just with a recursive and case insensitive grep. And that just pretty much spat out the path lib core Tiki filter. And so I opened that up and I started looking at the different files in there and there was one that was like prevent xss.php and pretty much that contained the class 
um, cheeky filter on the score prevent XSS. And then it also had the function filter, which is that cheeky filter, or, and then like dollar sign filter, filter value, pretty much. So that's what you call to actually um, filter the data. But scrolling down a little bit, we saw the whole remove XSS function within that class. And pretty much it's, it looks pretty intimidating when you first have a glance at it. It's like 100 or 200 lines long, and it's just a bunch of different tags and attributes that are blacklisted. But looking at this short list, we can see that there's a few tags back blacklisted, like styles, scripts, embeddeds, objects, applets, metas, iframes, frames, uh, layers, BG sound, base. So all of that stuff we already can't use for XSS. Now, going forward, we keep scrolling down and there's a bunch of attributes that are also blacklisted. So like, how in the heck are we going to actually pop XSS? Because this filter looks menacing. Now, there was 89 different attributes that were blocked. So like pretty much most of the common ways that you could think of um, just wouldn't work. Like it would replace it with pretty much an X tag in the middle of it. So like even if you put, say you made a script tag, but then you split script in half and you put like script on one side or like SCR on one side and IPT on the other side, um, it still wouldn't actually like make it valid tag because it's instead of just like removing the word script, it's just changing one of the letters to be an X tag, which is just nothing. But as we can see in the bottom uh, screenshot, you can see that it's doing like the remove XSS chars um, call, and then it's doing a remove XSS based on a regex. And yeah, it just looks just looks intimidating. <laughs> it just looks scary. But Coming away from looking at those functions, um, there's three main questions that I have is what HTML elements can I actually use that's not blacklisted to pop XSS? Um, what attributes for said elements can I use? Even if they are blacklisted, I still want to make a list of them. And how can I bypass that attribute blacks blacklist? Like that's going to be one of the main issues. So just off the top of my head, I can actually think of um, three different uh, XSS like kind of attributes that I can use and that aren't in the actual like tag list that are blacklisted. So we can use image image tags, we can use input tags, we can use SVG tags. There's probably more, but those are the three main that just come straight to my head. And then like for these attributes, like what can we actually, for these elements, what attributes can we actually use to pop XSS? So say um, with an image tag, we specify an invalid source. So we'll set the source to X and then on the actual error, um, we'll be executing our JavaScript. If we set the source to a valid image and then on the load of that image, we execute JavaScript with an input tag. We can make the browser autofocus to that input. And then on focus, which is what happens when the um, like user will click on the input and like type stuff in, you're focused on that element. And because we have autofocus, it will just directly execute that JavaScript. But the main problem is, is that the filter blocks these attributes. And that just sucks. Like, how are we going to pop XSS? That's my question. So let's take a step back and we'll have a look back at those XSS regexes. And what I noticed is that the XSS regex is <laughs> pretty much, that's what happens in Russia, Khan. I, I, I don't know. That's what I've heard. But Anyways, pretty much you 
with the um, remove regex, uh, remove XSS regex, we give the first um, like elements in as a list, and then we have the values. So say this will be the request underscore name or request name uh, parameter, and then we have the prefix. So for each attribute in the attribute list, that's blacklist, it's going to prefix the regex to that. And then if it finds that within the value, it's going to pretty much remove it just entirely. So how could we bypass this? I want to give you guys like a minute or two to think about that. And maybe just like drop it in the chat if you can think of a way to bypass this white space. Yeah. Potentially, but like, what escape chars would you use in HTML? If it's encoded, how would we actually um, have the renderer actually notice that it's a tag? So that's my question. But like, yeah, potentially, but it won't do that unless you actually like click on a link because Usually encoded links, they're like data, text slash, text slash HTML base 64. That would usually be in like that format. And say if we're trying to do like an image source X, and then on error, like, we just need to bypass that white character. That's what the backslash S is in regex. So the backslash X pretty much means all white spaces. So that's like spaces, tabs, um, enters, backspaces. Yeah, just pretty much everything. So that's that was my main problem. And I sat there and I thought about it for a few minutes. Then I realized that there's one simple way to do it. And that's just to not use white space. So pretty much with HTML, you can just use uh, the quotes and that will pretty much like identify the beginning and the end for the data of that attribute. And you don't actually need to have another space behind it. It's really simple and it's really stupid, but pretty much, like just as long as you have like an image source X and you have opening and closing, um, what's it called? Opening and closing, uh, I'm forgetting the name of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, air quotes, like quotes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, opening and closing quotes and then like on error, we can just pretty much execute anything and that will work and bypass the attributes filter for literally all 89%, uh, 89 of the um, actual, 89 of the actual like attributes in the blacklist. So we can just pretty much execute whatever trigger we want on the three elements that we have, which is image input and autofo, uh, image input and SVGs. Um, so coming back to my first three questions, um, what HTML elements can I use that aren't blacklisted to pop XSS? Um, we can use both image, input, SVG, literally any three. Uh, what attributes for element can for that element can we use? We can use literally whatever 
attribute we want as long as it actually um, triggers a JavaScript event, say on the page load or like when it's auto focused. And we can do that just by not using white space. And this also works for um, like single quotes as well as double quotes in HTML. So yeah, you can just begin and end with those quotes. I think I don't think there is another way to um, finish and end quotes in HTML, but if there is, then yeah, that's also another bypass for this XSS filter because you just bypass that regex. But yeah, um, I challenge four on uh, my site, Black Hat Fund on port 8000. Um, I actually implemented the uh, Tiki filter into the actual challenge. So if you wanted to go and like try and find um, your own bypass or like figure out another way to close a HTML tag, <laughs> I mean, attribute then yeah you can go test it there and yeah it's just a bit of fun but anyways uh thanks for listening guys uh, i'm jeremy i i'm zesh on like slack and stuff like that if you want to talk about anything or like just literally anything security just anything i don't know um just message me i'm always here uh it's on GitHub, the XSS sandbox. Um, that's not Zesh on GitHub, because Zesh was uh, taken. And the live demos on blackhat.fund on port 8000. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good, guys. Um, is there any questions you guys have before like, we sort of finish off the session for tonight? <laughs>